for all those who might be able to work. Okay. My name is Seth Timbridge here. I'm a support contractor for GSA and EVA. Um, so just trying to enhance my knowledge. Carla Morris with Key One Labs, be able to learn um, some issues in the estate and planning. Mary Gaines, GSA, Chicago Acquisition Service, the HSP 1200. John Sullivan, also GSA, they're my policy. I learned to understand what that meant. Thanks, John. <laughs> Um, I don't have something as funny as that. Um, I'm from Windbell, and we are a value-added reseller of IT services to the federal government, and Ping Identity is one of our client partners, and so just here to learn more about the process. I'm Mike Whitey Nobles. I'm with Social Techs. We do uh, secure enterprise collaboration and social networking. I'm here because of the conversation that you and I had yesterday, talking about, uh, <laughs> talking about um, ID and security needs, and trying to see how we might be able to help. Okay. Maria Wharton, MESEC. I'm interested in how the PIV card will work with more of the mobile commercialization <coughs> strategies that we're looking at, in particular um, GSA and a number of other uh, JPAS, NISPOM, DSS, ask the individuals to sign up for digital certificates, and there's not a lot of linkage or coordination, and I'd like to hear where we are with that. Cindy Stowe with GSA, the IPS portfolio, which all of this falls under. Just here to kind of get an update and just be on top of what's going on and what's being said from an agency and a vendor perspective. Okay, thank you. Mark Shepard with LexisNexis. I've uh, been in the identity management space for right at 12 years and interested in learning uh, what we've already deployed and other areas where we can assist better in the future. Jean-Marie Altima from Haiti. I am an IT specialist and uh, I am in uh, the Prime Minister. I'm Jason Walters with ISC Square. I'm just here to learn. <laughs> That's my answer. I, I usually do that. Uh, Jonathan Cantor, Chief Privacy <laughs> Officer at the Commerce Department. I like to call Deb the voice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I am uh, here to actually hear a lot about what you all are saying. I've, I've worked with Deb on some of these projects, and, and I'm really interested in just the discussion that's going to go on in the room. And I'm Mike Donaldson with Ping Identity, and I'm also here to hear what Deb has to say. And, uh, and we work with a lot of people on extending the reach of their identity. <coughs> and I'm Pamela Dingle. I also, this is the Ping row here. So. Uh, I'm a senior architect with Ping, and uh, yeah, I'm really interested in this conversation. And I'm Scott Landon with Ping Identity. I'm on the uh, business development side of the house and here to uh, listen to what you guys have to say and enjoy the fine coffee. <laughs> My name is Ray Coleman. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for the National Resource Conservation Service. Uh, it falls up under the USDA, one of our agencies. We have an ICAM project going on right now. And um, I'm here uh, just to find out a little bit more uh, as where the industry is going in terms of IDEA. Identity and access management. Okay. Uh, likewise, I'm from ISSPM for GIPSA, one of the uh, USDA agencies. Uh, we are uh, ICAM EEMS. Yes. Uh, rolled, we rolled out phase one with the digital signatures, phase two with the uh, certificates, I'm trying to, well, beta with that. And uh, actually, they're looking to move forward with ICAM with the first quarter of, well, the next quarter. So um, just looking to see what. I can, you can learn to take back. Okay. Thank you. Ken Van Langen, the uh, ISSO for the NOAA Joint Polar Satellite System. So I do satellite ground system security. Okay. So device certificates and things of that nature? Yeah, device certificates I'd be very interested in and, uh, you know, just for command and control aspects. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Yes, I'm Willie Harrison. I'm with the Office of Personnel Management. I'm Chief of Innovation for the HR Solutions Group. And um, uh, I'm interested in the evolution of the e-authentication e initiative that I had right. something to do with a eons ago. That kind of, uh, I, I, I don't want to say peaked out, but evolved. And I'd just like to know exactly where we are. Okay, good. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you. Quite a diverse um, group we've got. So. I'm going to, because of that, 
I'm going to give you a little bit of background. So back in the 90s, or around in there, we had um, a requirement in the federal government to say, all right, we need to identify our people. So what we came up with at that time was PKI. And we established the PKI. It um, has since become, it was uh, pretty well a stove pipe <coughs> um, application, depending on, hi, come on um, depending on the, um, the, uh, the needs of the agencies. So DOD had their PKI. We had um, several of the other agencies that stood up their own PKI. It was determined that that was um, very expensive. And in, I think it was 2006, there was a memo that was signed, and I don't remember exactly what the year was. You can probably help me out here. Um, there was a memo that was signed that said, you, unless you have a PKI stood up already, I guess it was before that, um, then you need to go to one of the shared service providers. So what we did was we developed a bridge, a hierarchical um, type of uh, structure for PKI, and that was to identify people. The Authentication Act was we determined that we needed to be able to authenticate the people that we were dealing with, addressing, in our networks and systems and things of that nature. And then HSP 12 came out. And what happened was that was a way of issuing identity credentials to all of the federal government employees <coughs> and their contractors that were behind the firewall in a like manner. So you can trust the infrastructure, you can trust the issuance of the um, are the processes that um, are, the card is issued under. The card itself is very secure. It has security mechanisms in place, and it's also implemented in such a way that it's consistent across the federal government. On that um, card, we have PKI certificates, at least a PIV auth certificate. Um, that's the one required one. And FAST, um, actually, of, of um, uh, GSA, has a managed service offering which issues to, I think it's 90 plus agencies now, right? Yeah. So um, we issue, it's a, uh, like I said, a managed service offering, and we issue to 90 plus agencies um, in GSA, but they have these PKI certificates that can all be tra chained back to uh, the federal PKI. Okay, so we've got some consistency there. Well, the CIO Council looked at all of these different efforts, and um, they actually stood up a new um, sub-working group under the CIO Council in 2008, I believe it was. That was the ICMC. Under the ICMC, the ICAMC, which is the Identity Credential and Access Management Subcommittee, was stood up, and that's the one that um, I'm co-chair for. And that brought all three of those programs together. So. What we did was we looked at it and went, okay, everybody's doing their own thing. How can we gain some efficiencies and how can we look at this, this, these programs and bring them together? So uh, we developed through um, a collaborative group the, the forum to include all of the different agencies within the federal government and said, what are the like services that everybody has to do? So for identity management and credentialing, there are 11, we have 11 use cases, but all of the services are similar. So in HR, when somebody comes on board, <coughs> there are certain things that have to occur for them to become either a federal employee or a contractor with the government. One of them is a background investigation, which will be on this cycle. Um, one of them is just you know, bringing you into the system, and then, allowing granting access to different applications. Now USDA, one of the government, um, one of the representatives back here, um, has actually incorporated a, a great deal of this segment architecture in USDA. What they do is somebody on boards, they have a service that provisions all of the different applications, so they have virtually a single sign-on for the, um, the apps that an individual would need to access in, in their day-to-day -day business. So they've gone a long way. Some of the other agencies are not quite as far along. But to go back to it, we developed a segment architecture. We have 11 different use cases. And um, that we published the segment architecture in 2009, um, but then we needed additional guidance for our group. So we started working on that. We have, um, as in fact, very recently today, I sent out to the ICAMC and uh, other people version two of the architecture of the program. And that went out, it should be posted on our site within a couple of days. It's not What's your site's name? idmanagement.gov. 
And um, so that, that's out there to, to try to help um, agencies understand how, what the best practices are and give them tips. It's a very long document, it's 500 pages. So, um, you know, and it will be changing as we move along. For instance, there are a couple of things that have occurred in this last couple of years that we've been developing that. In February, uh, we had OMB 2011 <coughs> signed. And what that said is, oh, by the way, services and agencies, you will start using the PIF card for physical and logical assets. Now, there are a bunch of ways, and Chase is going to talk about <coughs> that, that you can use the card and the information that's either available on the card or in the system. Um, another thing that we've done is we've looked at the mobile devices, and mobile is here. You know, uh, for the longest time, nobody wanted to talk about it. We're not going to do that. And there are security issues, and we understand there are security issues. Um, one of the efforts that's under, being undergone right now, in conjunction with NIST, is to be able to leverage the PKI services <coughs> that are on board the card and derive potentially. We haven't worked out details yet but potentially derive credentials to be put on the mobile devices to link the individual to the device, <coughs> to the identity. So, I, I, we haven't gotten very far with that yet. Um, we are looking for some assistance from, from industry you know, folks to help us with that because there are some security concerns. And there are security concerns as far as um, making sure that we're authenticating people appropriately. So folks like LexisNexis and others might be able to help us with that, especially when they're credentials that are not issued by the federal government. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about real very much is um, just recently we also had a memorandum signed out by the federal CIO, and that said you will accept these third-party trusted credentials. So some of our partners, um, Ping Identity being one of them, are helping us uh, learn how and do correctly, use their products correctly to accept the credentials that are issued by approved third-party credential issuers. Right now it's Google, it's PayPal, um, uh, we just had Verizon that was approved last, in fact I think the, the uh, news just went thing out went out design. today. Yeah. Right. So they have been approved at levels one, two, and three. Those of you who were in the audience yesterday, we talked about, or Ron Ross talked about um, FIPS 199, and you're supposed to look at your data and determine what level of assurance you need to protect that data, whether it's level one, or you know what the, if, it's, if it's low, medium, or high. We have taken, um, <coughs> it's, it's based on 863, which is a different document, of course, and said, all right, we have these levels of assurance, one, one through four, and how do they relate to the low, medium, and high <coughs> of your system and the, the, um, the data, the risk to your data. So these are some of the things that we've got. We are moving forward as far as the um, implementation of mobile devices. Again, we haven't worked out the details for that. Um, we are, let's see, what else? Oh, the discovery, you wanted to ask about that. So um, this is, it, as we move forward to implement the card um, or to implement the use of the PIV card in, in all of our services and things, we do have some issues like e-discovery. There, I will tell you that there are products out there that can help with that and I can talk to you a little bit offline. But the, the problem has been, it's been known for a while in DOD. And that is that if I encrypt my information locally, then decrypting it is, is, a, is a problem, right? So there are tools <coughs> that we use. Uh, one of them is that you might encrypt it. Um, I think it's called Opacity is the product, I believe, but I'm not sure. Anyway, you can encrypt, but it actually does it at a server level. Um, you say to encrypt it, and then it does it at the server level rather than with the card specifically. But you have, in order to access it, you have to have a valid card. So I don't know all the details, but there are things out there that you can work on with that. So um, we have a whole lot of biometrics work going on, and I'm going to let Chase talk about that. <laughs> 
Well, thanks, Evan. And just real quick, as far as uh, those of you who aren't familiar with uh, DHS's work in, in the U.S. Visit Program, uh, we stood up back in 2003 for identity and biometrics, mainly focused uh, on foreign nationals with the Department of State, uh, with border security, internal security. Uh, we've gotten to the point where our scale, um, we're at 130 million plus uh, unique identities as far as uh, biometrics, 255 million on the biographic and contextual data sites. We also, it's not just the biometrics world. Uh, we've been doing fingerprints um, since day one with uh, two prints. We're at fully at 10 print now. Uh, we've been uh, experimenting and uh, testing out multimodality, spatial, iris, uh, others. Uh, we're in really strong partnerships with FBI uh, and their biometrics programs at, the, at their CEGIS Center uh, and very strong relationships with DOD for interoperability. So the national program's perspective for biometrics and identity platforms and enterprises, uh, today we're, we're pretty much uh, there as far as sharing information appropriate, appropriately. Um, looking at securing, screening, vetting, credentialing. Uh, and like I mentioned, we focused on our core mission is you know, foreign nationals coming into the, into the country or getting a visa to visit uh, the United States uh, and then supporting our internal enforcement with Immigration Customs Enforcement uh, and otherwise. Uh, but we've also, since the early years, uh, because of, I mean, identity and biometrics <coughs> as a service or as a capacity, um, is not unique just to foreign nationals, that's just our, one of our main use cases. Uh, we've been supporting OPM for background investigations in conjunction with FBI for a very long time. We also support some of the DHS registered traveler programs. Uh, so our PIAs and our SORNs and everything are all appropriate that for, for U.S. citizens. Uh, so we've been supporting the background checks uh, that go into the PIV and HSPD-12 the biometrics that uh, are on the actual card itself are in those various systems at, at the enterprise level in, in the background. Uh, so some interesting capabilities uh, there from a biometrics and, and an identity standpoint. Um, we've also gotten into an international, to use the uh, Bobby's, you know, kind of the, that's the cyber term, I guess, the ecosystem. There's, you know, when we started this back in 2003, uh, FBI, of course, had a very large, you know, from law enforcement and investigations, uh, a database for biometrics, but on a national scale, there really wasn't anything of, of this nature. Uh, since 2003, when we ran, you know, ran this up, uh, now, internationally, there's biometrics and identity programs from the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Mexico, the EU. India is going to blow us away as far as scale. Uh, I talked about tens and hundreds of millions of unique guys with biometrics. You know, India is ramping up to, to the capital B billions. Um, so those kind of enrollment uh, challenges, uh, those kind of scale um, and identity matching systems is going to be very interesting. We're, we're working with them, with the government of India, as far as uh, sharing information and learning what they're learning. Um, and as they leapfrog what, what we've been doing. Um, as to HSPD-12, uh, as, as we all know, you know in the ICAM uh, world and on the actual PIV uh, card itself now, there is a biometric there. So utilizing third factor authentication um, is a possibility. Just like we've talked, I haven't seen many instances where we're actually leveraging that uh, at this point it's, we've issued out the, the badges. Um, going to mandatory logical and physical access control use of that uh, and then perhaps, I mean, we're even, you know, my, my colleague, uh, uh, Greg, who gets the 3 a.m. phone calls so when he's the operation guy, I get to do emerging tech, you know, fun stuff. Um, <laughs> but, then, you know, his challenge as a, as a, you know, CIO and any CIO or any uh, ops, you know, ops person um, is going to be, what are those certain uh, uh, privileges, rights and rules and accesses that I really want maybe a third factor authentication for my sysadmins and my DBAs or those you know, type of things. I mean, you know, it's defense in depth. Uh, so utilization um, of a biometric, you know, it'll come down to what's the use case and the role for security and then also cost. Because, you know, talking about today, you have to have 
you know, a keyboard biometric scanner if it's not built into your laptop or, or whatnot to, to capture that biometric and then, uh, you know, unlock the, the card and you know, use that. So you start getting into the actual nuances <laughs> of, meanwhile, the person's going to go, add, I'll just use my pen, you know, number type of thing. Uh, so those are cultural uh, challenges, but it's, it's there. It's, you know, it's the new, the new uh, standard that, that just came out. You know, continues to address and have uh, in the 500 pages there are biometrics in there, not just for your initial background, you know, uh, check, but for actual uh, use of, of the biometrics. What we're also seeing um, emerging again, it's it's um, has to be tied into this ICAM framework and it has to be tied into the credentialing and the background checks. But we're seeing the technology become more accurate and cost effective for let's say physical access control. So facial recognition, iris recognition at a distance and in a movement scenario, or at least a stop, start, queue management, getting into a facility, getting into a building, uh, et cetera. Uh, time motion studies of pulling, I'm so used to having my lanyard, uh, pulling out my, you know, my card. Um, so we're starting to see that for speed, accuracy, and at a distance. DOD is doing quite a few, uh, or about to start some things for uh, site access control utilizing facial recognition coming up to, to a gate, uh, so, so to speak. Again, so that's tying into the same uh, uh, framework. For mobility, uh, you know, we're seeing things come out with facial and voice recognition where it's not an extra sled on your, your iPhone or Android or Blackberry. You know, the phones that we have or issued today have pretty decent cameras nowadays, and they all have pretty good microphones. Uh, Iris requires some extra things on there just because of the nature of the, the, the lighting and whatnot. Uh, but some interesting things coming out for logical access control uh, on the commercial market that could be applied in the mobility space. Uh, we're already utilizing webcams and uh, OCS cams and other things for telework, teleaccess. Potential there for in the ICAM <coughs> world, maybe that's a factor and reuse of the same equipment because we're all faced with, with return on investment and, and lower budgets. So if we're already having that stuff out there for uh, telecommuting, telepresence, telework, uh, DR. Perhaps we can deliver the same uh, equipment. Uh, now, what that proposes also, though, is other challenges for liveness detection. Okay, now I'm in a mobile situation. I'm using biometrics as a main you know, factor. How do I know it's me and not a, you know, an image or somebody else is using that? So I think that's continuation of the technology and, and the solutions coming out for liveness detection. Uh, and I actually, uh, well. DARPA is actually doing some interesting things. They just came out with a public RFI the other week about uh, identity and what's the next generation of identity beyond even the things we're talking about, which is just evolutionary of, of the current technologies we have now. And then I can't even see if people grab my lane. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're so used to it, actually. <laughs> used to it. Uh, but you know, they're looking at what is. You know, how do you verify an identity beyond a thing? Yes, it's, in, it's in my pocket. Now, yes. <laughs> you feel more comfortable. It's, a, it's, a, it's, like a, it's a, like a blanket, right? It's my security blanket. Um, but, uh, and pun intended. Um, but you know, looking, at, uh, looking at those, uh, what is the next 10 years and what are those technologies that we, you know, from key, you know, what's your pattern of keystroke to, you know, I mean, really, we're looking at the science fiction things. Uh, so that's really kind of what, what's, you know, what are those future solutions that will you know, enhance our security uh, and identity. And as we move into mobility, it's, it's, it's already there and it's not going to get any less. So how do we tackle it on, on you know, from non-repudiation to just basic security, rules, rights, accesses, attributes, you know, attached to my identity. Uh, and I think we're going to see, we're a small drop in the bucket. Um, as far as the federal space and I can, I think we're going to see biometrics, identity writ large um, from the private sector, from financial institutions and, and uh, the insurance companies and the credit cards uh, and the e-health records. So it's that, that in-stick trusted identity ecosystem on how is it Amazon.com or Equifax or LexisNexis or who's my trusted identity provider and, it, and does it include biometrics? I, I can't see it not including biometrics in the future. Um, I, I really can't. There's just 
there's too many ways to spoof up with other things. Um, so I think biometrics tied in with, with identity is going to going to continue. I'm not that I'm biased or anything, but uh, it's uh, I, I think that's going to be the way to go with uh, identity theft um, and the issues that we have with our with our uh, security. Not to mention efficiencies of single sign-on. <coughs> want to use my card or just I just want to go in and actually be able to do my work without having to go through 12 different screens and the help desk and gosh help me if I have to actually do a joint field thing with, with my peers, right? I, I, I you know, I'm not on air card and my whole infrastructure with me. So that's my two cents feel on uh, where, where I see things going with it. So we, um there was one question or comment about using the card and how we can use it in other ways. And like Chase said, we want to reuse the infrastructure that we put in place, right? But at the same time, we don't want to create other infrastructure that's required. So a couple of things that we have going on is um, one that's called the back-end attribute exchange. That can be almost anything, whether it's the biometric that, or a biometric that's sent across the wires to um, grant access, but that's a decision it will always remain like local, that um, you know, it is kind of defined in, in a profile or some other mechanism. But what we're doing is we, as part of our um, information exchange, we're exchanging attributes, so we don't have to keep these big stores of um, personal attributes or biometrics or things of that nature. And, and um, we do, we have been talking, and at least we haven't gotten very far with it because I think it was like two months ago I talked to a couple of lots of happened since then. But um, using the, the capabilities that US Visit has got and the databases that, that they have access to, to go and, and re <coughs> look because all of this change, you know, and things happen. And is part of maybe continuous monitoring or continuous identity vetting. Um, one of the things that we need to do is make sure that, well, maybe not make sure, but a lot of us are interested in, in whether or not somebody got arrested last week and um, you know, they might be able to help with that through the, the stores of the information that they have. So it's, it's protecting our data, not exposing it, um, because the right people have got um, access to the data. They, are, um, they have been authenticated properly uh, with both our biometrics and the attributes. So we can combine those things to bring the higher level of assurance that the person is who they say they are. So I mean that's that's a real broad brush, and um, I think a lot of people are interested in the, the trusted third-party credentials, and we will be glad to talk about that as well if you're interested in that. But um, it's it's primarily using the information that um, a an identity provider can can bring to the table and allowing access to government sites, mostly externally facing, government sites using that credential rather than using one that we generate in the federal government. So you don't have to do username and password over and over and over again because I've got a site here at GSA that needs to have a log on, I've got a site over here at, I don't know, let's visit, that, that is one that you would have to log on to and get another username and password. So this goes to the instinct idea that you don't have to have 47 different ones. You can use one, um, whether it's your government ID or if it's your you know, identification or if it's one that, that is issued extra. So that's the way, that's kind of in a real high level what that one is about. We have some questions here. <laughs> she had her hand up first. Beat you. Did the um, recent, uh, several months ago, hack into the credential uh, that kind of Did you know dark thing? Yeah. Did you know dark? Yeah. Did, did um, that put any breaks or um, think, do you think twice or three times about using third party service or anything? Um, no. Actually, <laughs> it was it was a, a different situation. Um, I can tell you that um, that actually got hacked. The CA got hacked. Um, our PKIs have uh, certificate authorities have not been. Um, we did recently, um, and it's public, so I don't mind saying anything about it. Uh, the PA had an IG report that 
said that their procedures may not be as robust as what needed to be. So there was a lot of, um, a lot of, some, yeah, so there was, there was a lot of discussion about that. I have to say that. Um, but we did go back and look at the PPM policy authority, did go back and look at the procedures that um, VA had put in place to mitigate those problems. And it, it, it was, as many IG reports are, it was um, not as complete as it, it could have been. Like that. <laughs> so, but the did you know tar thing was, yeah, sorry, I, I did have to skip around. But um, did you know tar was a different thing, and part of theirs was that they had been exposed, and they didn't notify anybody for months. So with some of the things that we have in place, um, we don't feel like that's a problem, and so we do monitor that on a continuous basis. Question with the, we run a virtual desktop. The concept of bring your own devices, whether it's mobile, actually a home computer. Are, is there an issue with inserting a PIP card in a home computer? So I know, for example, when you insert it into a work computer, it uploads your certs into the Microsoft certificate store, whether you want it to go there or not. So is there an issue with that happening on a home computer? So for example, on a home computer, I can insert a PIP card reader, start a virtual desktop, and digitally sign documents at work. Um, I guess my question is, is that an issue, a security issue? Not to me. <laughs> I mean, some people might say it is, but um, <coughs> your certificates are public. So, so there's not a, a, a security issue there. Um, there are policies that it's a problem for. Um, you know, um, if you're using your home computer and you upload your certificate, you know, some agencies don't like that. They don't want you to use your gift card extra to uh, the work environment and the hardware. Did you? Well, no, I was going to But as we move into virtual desktops and virtual OS for teleworking, VPN, et cetera, I mean, you're going to be allowed to do it, so you're going to have to. I mean, it just depends on the agency policy. But yeah, I don't see it as technical. I ask, what, you know, look, we're always scared of things we don't know anything about, right? right. We just have that natural reaction, and, and we have done this, I hate to admit it. But people gasped at Treasury when they heard that we were digitally signing documents from home computer on a, with a virtual desktop. And, and we were trying to actually get a, uh, gone through the department to get a read on that. It's taken a very long time. It's, right. it's easy to say no. Yeah, it, it, I, I agree. <laughs> well, but if they say no, it, it really does have implications, right? Because the whole concept of bring your own devices goes away. So, so for example, if you want to get into iPads and iPhones, now you're talking about the government provided devices. And right. one of the nice effects we've had from virtual desktops, people have brought our TTV junk, thrown it, said, I don't want to use our own stuff. And that saved us a lot of money. But have you had any HR, equal opportunity, or other lawsuits related to credentials on the virtualized desktops, laptops, home use? Have you had any issues from that yet? Lawsuits? Yeah. No. So one of the questions that I have when I think about uploading the, the digital certificate and looking at it from a home use is when you wipe their pictures or the fact that it's a virtual machine on an operating system and you go to an issue in which you need under electronic discovery that information back and you go to claw back the information on their home system. Yeah, we, we so nothing, so I, I didn't, Nothing work related touches the home computer. Okay. It's right. virtual, actually all it's on the virtual machine. Right. On the mm -hmm. It's an it's a it's an it's an unintended consequence of the way Microsoft works. So our certificates on the path from reader operating system, the virtual desktop, unfortunately also upload to the store. We would never go discover certificates, for example. So we have had union inquiries about discovery on virtual desktop not related to certificates. Okay. So I guess you don't have questions. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. If you look at the remote key device from Fusion for the identity, yeah. using the PIP card, that way you can use remote your home computer, but really authentically back to your work computer. And and I looked at it a while ago, I haven't re-looked at it, I need to go back. What's it called? Remote key. Yeah, it's a new one. 
There's a, um, I haven't looked at it in, in a while. We, there, there are a few agencies on the DHS that have been using MobiKey, but not the MobiKey linked to actual logical access with it, but they've been using MobiKey for, for a while. So that's, MobiKey, Citrix, good. I mean, there's, you know, various solution bases for, for that. And then you can tie in, um, you know, the PIV card, the CAT card, right. you know, authentication into, you know, into it. And then can you, you leverage, if, right now, like, certain agencies don't have PIV card readers throughout the agency. So you can use the fusion device, both at home and at work, and leverage that capability. So, yeah. Congress has those. Congress has them. Yeah. <clears throat> I had a high, a high level observation, uh, comment, I guess. Um, since we're, I would say, you know, USDA, well, I know our, our particular agency uses it, those concepts, I can concepts, or thin card. But one is, I guess, um, is there any discussion on a high level to, to push down guidance to have in order for the PIV card to be mandated, it would have to be integrated into AD, whatever ACL that they're using. Okay. Then two, they would have to get more light stations. I know with federal government, you need more stations set up in the field offices or remote locations. So in the event that people need to update their certs and everything. So no, I guess in other words, is there any guidance, any guidance coming down, coming down to the agency to have them required to purchase these systems, these light stations that will allow them to efficiently incorporate. There are a couple of people right here that can answer that question. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> USDA has a help desk that they coordinate everything for you in terms of what you need. Uh, we are, uh, we've worked on, on lightening the footprint basically and with the light activation machines and you can actually do uh, what's available now is desktop research. So you don't have to go anywhere. Uh, the only time you would have to go to a live activation station is if you have a problem. So um, uh, we, we've done a lot of things to streamline it. The service is not the same service it was five years ago. Um, so we're, we're constantly making improvements on the technology side. You, USDA has got, we've got one person in every county in the United States. So it's about as decentralized as you can get. So. Uh, but with that, we've made some accommodation for servicing the population and new services at the end of the cycle. Uh, the light credentialing kits, uh, or the light activation kits, uh, were the first go around, and the next stage was to fill out desktop access, which is what we've done. So we're continuing to look at it and, and make further improvements. <coughs> so can I just ask what? When you're saying desktop research, does that mean I can update some of these certificates without them having to show up at a credential? Right. As long as as long as you have a fingerprint machine that you can do a, a uh, biometric. So if they have a, a fingerprint reader, for example, on their laptop, we could do that. Yes. Yeah, where where would you get the information on that? Well, where would I get the information? Are you are you, 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 you a customer? Yeah, he's treasurer. He's treasurer. Treasure. 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 Um, Gina Reyes. Gina Reyes. Yeah. Okay. We work with Gina, so it's news to me. <laughs> <laughs> me too. So it sounds like you guys have got the same problem we do. Hard to see. Can I talk to Gina myself? Can I talk to Gina myself? You're in USDA. Yes. Yeah, so we can cross the ID man who's gotten up to the point. Okay. And what was the news to you? For us. Did you hear that? We can cross the ID man who's gotten up to the point. <laughs> so, um, I, I think probably all of you know it, but there is special pub 116, 116. I just lost the number. Um, but that talks about uh, different access control levels for um, physical access into um, printed products. Um, and that, that goes up to biometric plus the pin plus, you know, that type of thing. So if you haven't seen that, um, it's one more special product you can read if you want. Do we have some other questions? Yes, one more question that I won't ask anymore, I promise. No, no, no. <laughs> so, right here. One of the things that's proved to be immensely useful with the PIV card, actually more useful than log on is digital signatures. It's really been a boon for us. So the, the but it's we don't know what we're doing, I guess, at the bottom. We do the best we can do. We talk to like Adobe for settings. So USDA had a doc 
So for example, we'd sign a document, it would go from nothing to three meg, we put a second signature, it goes to 20 meg. So USDA had a thing out on the website saying, well, uncheck the thing that says include the revocation information. And so is, is there any thought of how we would do that within the federal government for digital signatures? And in, I'm getting tons of questions because we, we transact with industry all the time, what the next step would be for us to transact digital signatures with industry. In other words, a, an internal, external, digital signature reference architecture. Um, excellent idea. I, I will be glad to take it back and maybe put it in one of the architecture work groups or something like that under the I can see to, to um, you know, at least start talking to it. And, then, and, and one of the benefits to doing that is um, having all of us as the federal government talking to the, the individual providers so that we're giving a consistent view and consistent statement. So that's a good idea. Thank you. Idea. I have a question about industry, though, in what context? So for example, industry will submit to us an application for a permit to manufacture alcohol beverages. Okay. That has to be signed. There's um, powers of attorney. There's all kinds of signature right. issues with submitting that electronically. It's, it's that type of thing. Yeah. And, and we also have, there's a, a tool out there that, um, uh, that this, um, the Federal Register, they're not using PDF. They're not using Adobe, so we do have a tool that could be downloaded that could be used for some of these other products. You have to kind of run it through legal and your IT guys and stuff like that to make sure that it's okay, but we do have that, so if you want to, you can contact me and I'll be glad to give you the link to that. Here, here, this is related to what, what we're, we're also starting to digitally sign our documents, okay? Uh -huh. And when I went to our legal guys, they said as long as the document is not going to be used outside of ATF, the digital signature is authorized. If it's going to go outside of ATF, you need permission from God. So maybe, maybe. Uh, in person. In person? Yeah, it, yeah. It, yeah. Don't use a blue pen. You need to make an appointment a long time ago. But, but the, one, of the things, one, of the things that, one of the things that you all can help us is to start getting a legal opinion about docu about the signature of documents that have to go outside, you know, in other words, X, do X public document can be signed digitally. Okay, so so that's beautiful segue to one other thing that we've got going on. It's actually going through the LRM process right now. What does that stand for? Um, legal and legislative or review, something or other. Anyway, it's a formal um, process through OMB we have an e-signature guidance document. And it talks about um, when a, a signature can be considered valid, when it's, uh, when it's a digital signature, which kind of digital signatures and things of that nature. So that is going through the process. You should be, somebody in your agency should be seeing it very soon um, to review and comment on it. But that, that document has been developed and um, is being reviewed. Definitely check that because it's going to still tell you to consult. Yeah, it's, it, it's going to tell you to talk to your lawyers. I mean, I mean, if there's, if there's, if there's, if there's well, it tells you when. But it tells you when you need to talk to your lawyers. But you know, you could bring them in at the very onset, and if they know what's going on, you know, a lot of times they're more amenable to to letting you do something if they understand it from the get go. Or at least that's what I think. Don't you think? Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> I've kind of taken this up. I think we're about um, at the end stage. I'm going to be around for a while. Um, I think James yeah. might be. One more? Okay. Yeah, I got a question. No, well, I don't want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you're, you've got more access to the federal office and Has there been any discussion on having the standardized version controls like with Microsoft Windows or Adobe or? And explore. For us to well, well, across the board, because the, the biggest problem is, is that a lot of these agencies, depending upon where they fall in the budget mix, right. will depend upon how much money their IT departments get and what version control they're working on, which impacts the operation of all the stuff across the government. So, has there been any discussion on, on trying to bring everybody up to the same playing field so that everybody can use the stuff? and, and well, 
there's most optimal conditions. been discussion, but we haven't gotten far because we all do have our own budgets and we all do have our you know, requirements in IT and things of that nature. But we can talk about it offline, but not not in the practice. Mike, Microsoft XP is installed the you know, standard. <laughs> 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 I think we're out of time. Um, I'm going to be around for a while. I'll be here.